Okay. I hope if you're, you're hearing my voice, you're in the right Zoom call, which is the Nebraska Water Center's 2020 mini conference, which we affectionately called it. Um, good afternoon, welcome. I'm glad that you guys could join us. Uh, just right off the bat, we're not using the Zoom webinar um, functionality. This is just a kind of traditional Zoom call. So it looks like everybody's got very good um, adherence already, but if you would please mute your microphones um, if you're just joining us to follow along. And um, if you're not familiar with how to get to and see speakers, um, please do switch it in the upper right-hand corner of the screen to speaker view so that you don't have to wade through all these different squares um, and figure out who is it, who is it, like a, like a game show almost. So um, that should get you where you need to be. And I'll take a quick second just to tee things up. Uh, really looking forward to this afternoon and to our mini conference. My name is Jesse Starita. Um, it's my first time ever wearing a sport coat and surgical gloves, but welcome to COVID in 2020. I'm the public relations and engagement coordinator here at the Nebraska Water Center. Um, as many of you know, we were supposed to be gathered um, today in Scotts Bluff uh, in partnership with the Panhandle Research and Extension Center and the North Platte NRD for our annual water conference, uh, which we held last year in, in Norfolk, and we were looking forward to getting back on the road um, to Scotts Bluff. We hope we can do that next year, but for right now, for today, I think uh, we're all just doing the best that we can and, and still um, sharing knowledge and, and resources about Nebraska's water. So um, I want to just recognize quickly at the outset all of the staff, uh, the interns, and the different partners at the Panhandle Research Center, Dr. Jack Whittier and others, and then also at the North Platte um, Natural Resources District, John Burge, Bart Cross, and, and their staff for um, helping to organize what we thought would be the, you know, the in-person conference and what turned out to be this eventual session this afternoon. Um, so with those particulars uh, out of the way, I thought I would also just mention that these sessions, both the, the hydrogeology right now and then the 315 uh, sociology will be recorded in, in the cloud uh, through Zoom and then we'll post them on our Water Center's YouTube page. So you're welcome to relive the, uh, the moments uh, here in the next day or two. I hope we can post those on, on our YouTube page. So without further ado, um, many of you know, right here to my right, uh, Tricia Liebley. She's a longtime program assistant at the Water Center, and she is going to um, introduce our speakers for the first session, which again is on the hydrogeology of Western uh, Nebraska's water. So Tricia, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, our first two speakers today are Stephen Sabre and Troy Gilmore. Steve is a geoscientist at UNL located at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center since 1989. He earned his BS degree in geology from the University of California at Davis and his master's degree in geology from the University of New Mexico. Steve previously worked for 13 years in the private sector before joining UNL. And after Steve, we'll have Troy Gilmar, he is a groundwater hydrologist and assistant professor in the Conservation and Survey Division, School of Natural Resources and Biological Systems Engineering Department at UNL. His research focus is on groundwater quality, the interactions of groundwater and surface water, and groundwater age dating and isotopes as tools to understand how water resources respond to changes in management. So take it away, Steve. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that introduction, Trish. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a couple of water quality issues in the North Platte Valley from a hydrogeological perspective. Um, 
Our first slide shows the saturated thickness. Primarily, we're going to talk about the quaternary alluvium that is located in Scotts Bluff, Morrill counties, and goes into Garden County. It reaches a maximum of maybe 200 feet in saturated thickness, and it thins north and south. We also will talk a little bit about Pumpkin Creek, which doesn't really show up on saturated thickness here, but uh, it does have some bearing on what the topics we're going to be discussing. Surface water irrigation uh, in Scotts Bluff County, the water is coming from the North Platte River. It's diverted in Wyoming. And we have the highest number of, of surface irrigated acres in the state. We also have a, a, a conjunctive use situation where we have considerable uh, groundwater wells developed. And it, it has a profound impact on the quantity of water we have in our local aquifer and the quality. Impact the surface water irrigation. The leaky canals lose somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of their water. Uh, however, it's not lost to the system, it recharges our aquifer. In the early 1990s, we conducted a, a study at University Lake in cooperation with the North Platte NRD and local landowners. What we found was that the North Platte River chemistry dominates recharge to the shallow aquifer. Our local groundwater, or native groundwater, if you will, is largely calcium bicarbonate. On the other hand, the North Platte River water is much higher in sulfate. The sulfate component is going to get interesting as we get along in this talk. This shows the setting of that University Lake study. Here's Scott's Bluff. Whoops, backwards. And uh, we have Interstate Canal above. Whoops. Okay, here's the setting. Wyoming, Nebraska line here. The North Platte River enters into the North Platte Valley off of the Guernsey Reservoir. Glendale Reservoir is upstream. And here's Interstate Canal is here. Scott's Bluff is here. All right. This shows the local geology and the uh, University Lake area. Uh, this vertical exaggeration is 20 times. We have a leaky canal here, online canal, and uh, we have QAL, also some probably just sand blown in, overlying uh, weathered or fractured brule formation. We have uh, nested piezometers at different depths and, and down in the unfractured or uh, the rather tight brule. This diagram shows the Shallow groundwater has a significant, this is a Piper diagram, and it shows that we have a canal water and shallow groundwater have the same composition. It is higher in the sulf sulfate composition. Groundwater of gradient from the canal has a uh, composition that's largely calcium bicarbonate. Uh, this is tight brule and some shattering wells thrown in. It doesn't, it's not pertinent to what we're talking about in the shallow groundwater aquifer. This diagram shows the hydrologic cycle as we understand it in the North Platte Valley. We have these leaky irrigation canals that provide a great deal of recharge. We have streams in the area that are trout streams that did not exist as perennial streams until the canal system was put in. We have evapotranspiration, which is very high in this part of the state. Precipitation, I wish we had these arrows smaller because we don't get much precipitation. Our average uh, annual rainfall in the Scotts Bluff area is around 15 inches. Water quality issues, the two we're going to talk about primarily today are nitrate and uranium. Uh, Troy will be handling the nitrate. He's our expert in nitrates. I'll just briefly mention, we did a recon uh, study with the USGS in 1991 sampling. Uh, the nitrate I should mention is the MCL maximum contaminant level is very well established. It's 10 parts per million. It uh, causes blue baby syndrome and the University of Nebraska takes this health problem a, it's very seriously. The School of Natural Resources, which I'm part of, has recently hired 
Martha, uh, I think it's Martha Rhodes, who's an expert on the health impacts of nitrates, and I think atrazine. What we found in the 1991 sampling was that slightly less than 7% of the wells sampled in the valley, five out of 74, had uh, exceeded the MCL. At that point in time, the, uh, there weren't monitoring wells established as well as they are now. Uh, most well all samples were irrigation wells because that's the only, at that time, the state required to, to uh, register the, uh, at that time, the, the wells for the irrigation wells and have the geology or drillers log. Okay, but I should say that the nitrates are much more widespread throughout the area and uh, uh, there are some areas where we, if you will, have hot spots where nitrates continue to rise. Uranium, uh, the uh, MCL for that is established at 30 parts per billion, much, much lower. It's considered carcinogenic due to its radioactivity. However, uh, uranium itself has a long half-life and it's not that radioactive. When you think of a prospector out there with a Geiger counter or salometer and they're looking for uranium, they're not detecting uranium directly. They're de detecting daughter products such as radium and bismuth-214. It is also a heavy metal and it has chemical toxicity established and it impacts kidneys. As in 1991 uh, uh, sampling, Three out of the 17 wells that were tested for uranium, 18% of them uh, exceeded the MCL. It's very limited data. Uh, I think it costs a little bit to an analyze for uranium. However, during the 1970s, there was extensive data derived from a study that we'll talk about a little bit later. Well, if you understand uranium, it's a very simple chemistry. There was two oxidation states plus four, or tetravalent uranium, or plus six, hexavalent uranium. Hexavalent uranium is very soluble in water. Uh, it forms complexes with carbonate. It is not that soluble when it's in presence of vanadium. On the other hand, tetravalent uranium is very insoluble in the right environment in water, in low oxygen environments. And the, where we have a lot of oxygen available. Uh, they are uh, uranium minerals such as coffinite and uraninite are solubilized to hexavalent uranium. Sources for uranium. When you're exploring for uranium, I used to work as an exploration geologist for a mining company in New Mexico. But you look for, uh, in sedimentary rocks, you look for sources. Volcanic ash, or I should say volcanic glass, is a great source for, for uranium. Granite can also be a good source. Perhaps black shale is an overlooked source. In black shale, we have you know, small quantities of pyrite plus uh, very small quantities of uraninite if there's a lot of carbonaceous material. And essentially, where the pyrite is weathered or oxidized, it's a source of sulfate, which we mentioned earlier. And also, the uraninite will be solubilized when it's weathered to uh, hexavalent uranium. This slide shows a uh, black shale, and it is in Cretaceous Shale in Boyd County, Nebraska. There is a small fault that uh, is white in there. And uh, the upper portion of this thing, you can see a little bit of yellow material there, a little orangish. That's where you're having pyrite oxidized to iron oxides. But the black shale, there's a lot of carbonaceous material in there. There's a little bit of pyrite, and there's a very minuscule amount of uraninite. Black shale is, has slightly higher radioactivity than other uh, marine rocks that maybe, you know, the sandstones will have less radioactivity. This is weathered Pierre shale. A, this is a paleosol or fossil soil outcrop in Sioux County, Nebraska. The 
Pyrite has been oxidized. We have iron oxides, that's the coloring, the yellow, it's probably gothite. And if there was any uh, uraninite, it has been probably turned into hexavalent uranium and it's probably ended up in the Gulf of Mexico. When Doug and I do test tolls, we have seen cases where we've encountered this zone in the subsurface and it has a less radioactivity than the other uh, unweathered. And occasionally what we see is a little gamma spike between the oxidized portion and the unoxidized uh, uh, unweathered uranium. Source of uranium in the High Plains Aquifer. Nitrate was linked to uranium in a paper that was very notable by Nolan and Weber in 2015. They came up with a very interesting idea that uh, nitrate is oxidized insoluble uh, uranium minerals to the soluble hexavalent. And that and, uh, it was an excellent paper in many respects. Very good discussion of uranium chemistry. Excellent statistical analysis. Excellent uh, references. Very, uh, very interesting paper. They found a good statistical correlation in the High Plains Aquifer and the California Aquifer. However, correlation does not mean causation. And uh, I, th I think this new mechanism merits serious discussion. And I'll tell you where I fall in it. I think it's a very good paper, but I disagree with their conclusions. And we'll go through that. This is figure number one, interpolation of uranium and nitrate concentrations in the High Plains Aquifer. What we have here is, um, in the red is the uranium concentrations above 30 parts per billion. You're looking at the very dark red. And here we have uh, nitrates and blue, and the very dark blue is above 10 parts per million. And right here, we can see our area, North Platte Valley we're discussing. We can also see here where the South Platte River enters in to Nebraska, very high levels. That's interesting. And for Mark Burback, who's on, this is Lodge Pole Creek. We have high values there. We'll be discussing these areas. Okay, once again, this is a same, same scale map, High Plains Aquifer, spatial correlation grid showing the statistical correlation between groundwater uranium and nitrate concentrations. Very high at the Southern High Plains. And we're gonna go up here, South Platte River, Lodge Pole, North Platte Valley, and a little bit of Pumpkin Creek Valley. All right, the question is, where, in my mind, the paper bothered me, it was very well written, and I thought, geez, this is something exciting, it was interesting. But I started thinking, well, where are these uranium minerals, uraninite? Where are we, you know, where is this impacting them? And usually uraninite is found in confined aquifers with low oxygen and most likely with a reductant. And a lot of times you find a little bit of pyrite. And uranium geologists, we can't see the uranium minerals. It's very, you know, they're very... Uh, not very visible, but pyrite is a mineral that is happy in the same place that uranium tetravalent minerals are happy. They're used, uranium is usually not, tetravalent uranium minerals are not usually found in unconfined aquifers, unless there is a, a large amount of carbonaceous material present, or there has been methane gas or hydrogen sulfide. Nitrate uh, contamination, on the other hand, is usually found in shallow, unconfined aquifers with high oxygen. And in those situations, the stable uranium is going to be the hexavalent. It's very soluble. And we're going to look at three areas in the uh, High Plains Aquifer. This is also from the paper by Nolan and Weber. Uh, area number one is southern high plains. Number two is outside the high plains aquifer. It's the Arkansas River Valley. Up here, as I mentioned before, we have the South Platte River. We're not really going to go into that, but what it is, what I describe here 
is also going on along the South Platte River. And then lastly, we will discuss our area here in the North Platte Valley. Area number one, you need to know that there's calcrete uranium deposits in the Southern High Plains Aquifer. This is, uh, study was done by Susan Hall and others at the U.S. Geological Survey. Calcrete forms in arid to semi-arid climates. Evaporation concentrates the hexavalent uranium that's present. It's a, this is in a discharge area of the High Plains Aquifer. The source is thought to be the, in the Triassic strata of New Mexico, where there is a, uh, the Triassic strata of the Colorado Plateau, typically there's, it's a very uranium rich air, uh, strata. There's also volcanic glass in the High Plains Aquifer. The USGS did not mention any tetravalent uranium as the High Plains Aquifer in this particular area. They also dated the Sulphur Springs deposit in this area at 190,000 years. There is no human influence on this particular uranium occurrence. As I said, correlation is not causation. This is the map from the Susan Hall's work and others. Down up here we have Amarillo. Down here is Midland. I spent four long years in Midland and the water quality down there is terrible. Here's the location of the, let's see, here's the location of the Sulphur Springs deposit, buzzer draw. These are two prospects developed by Kermagee back in the 1970s. And these little uh, green squares are prospect areas that they were considering at that particular time. Recharge areas are up here, discharge off to the east. Here is uh, carnitite on outcrop, the sulfur springs deposits, the bright yellow mineral, it looks like it's painted on. All right, area number two, Arkansas River Valley, extensive irrigation, uranium concentrations exceed 100 parts per billion. Source uh, from USGS geological survey work, Cretaceous black shales. Mechanism is the leaching of the black shale and evapotranspiration. Nitrate mechanism is possible, but not necessary in this particular area. This shows the uh, geologic map with uh, the concentrations of, the, of water samples along the Arkansas River starts up here, headwaters up near Leadville. We have secondary sources of uranium and Precambrian granite and some tertiary age volcanics. And as we enter into the area, you, you see there is a little bit of uranium. The size of the dot gives you the size of the concentration. And as we get into the Cretaceous, we have increasing and it increases downstream as we leach more uraninite out of the Cretaceous shales. I should point out this yellow is also just quaternary sand deposits on top of Cretaceous. As I mentioned earlier, the South Platte River, it also drains an area where there's Cretaceous shales. I've, here's a schematic showing the source is this, this non aquifer material. There's aquitards are probably the source of uranium. We have surface water, which usually is highly, has high dissolved oxygen. We have the alluvial aquifer here where you have groundwater development. You don't have groundwater development in this area. You have this surface water that's leaching the black shale and it goes into the uh, local aquifer here. Nitrate, possibly, it's a new mechanism, but reason why it's new is because it's overlooked because usually we have enough, in our shallow aquifer systems, we usually have enough oxygen to dissolve it. All right, area number three. Highest uranium values are found within the surface irrigation area. This is from the 
NERI data, NERI stands for National Uranium Resource Evaluation, 1970s. I was involved in that in a different situation in, uh, down in New Mexico in grad school. In the North Platte Valley, I'm gonna say that there are no tetravalent minerals in the shallow walk for system. What we also see is uranium and sulfate increase due to evapotranspiration. A possible source, and I could only say this is possible, I'm speculating a little bit here, is leaching Cretaceous shales in Wyoming in the Casper area. The Kendrick Irrigation Project, there's a selenium problem. Selenium follows sulfur. Yeah, there's a sub substitution of selenium with pyrite, and, uh, and there's also selenium minerals in, in some cases. They're very similar to pyrite in, in behavior. Up in the Casper area, it's too cold. The growing season too short. Hay is grown, nitrate is not added. Okay, this is the NERI data. This was done in cooperation. This map was put together with the data that I pulled off years ago, uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and the North Platte Energy helped put this together with the GIS person who was working there. As you can see, all these red uh, dots are the, in the surface water irrigation area. They range from 30 to 123 parts per billion. Okay. All these green dots are low in uh, uranium. In Pumpkin Creek area, we do have some moderately high uranium comp composition. I think that's coming out of volcanic glass in the Brule Formation. I think we got two sources, uranium. One is the imported water we get in our surface water distribution system from the uh, North Platte River. And uh, the other is a secondary source. I don't think the volcanic glass is that important of the source. As we go down Pumpkin Creek, it decreases. Okay. Ogallala formation, I've never seen pyrite in it. Maybe Jim Gakey has, but I have never seen it. Usually when pyrite's present, uraninite is probably happy too. But uh, anyway, uh, that's what we have in the North Platte NRD. We overlay the, if you will, the uh, surface water irrigated acres, and you can see where the, there's a very good correlation between the surface water and the high uranium concentrations. Here is one graph. I'm gonna only show you one graph today, and this is it. It's limited data. What we've got is uranium versus sulfate. There's a basically a linear trend, and it's a mixing line. And the red dots are sampled in the North Platte uh, River near Bridgeport. Uh, and we've had, Bridgeport early on had a, had a big problem. And they've actually, they treat their water in that at this point in time. We've had several other communities that have to treat their, their water to get rid of the uranium. Okay, the North Platte River, before we read, just down gradient or just downstream, I guess you say, uh, from the Guernsey Reservoir, the average sulfate was 200 parts per million. Unfortunately, we don't have any uranium analysis. I wish they had. It would really make this work better. But this is data from the 1950s to, to current, and they range in value from 100 to 430 parts per million sulfate. If this linear trend holds, we've had some high uranium values come introduced into the valley in the surface water irrigation system. And uh, I should say these values down here are very low. And this is area towards Lake McConaughey where we have an influx, a lot of ground, groundwater from the sand hills. That area, you know, of course, is low nitrates, but it's also an area where I think the largely what I see in the Ogallala formation, I don't see anything that would make me think that there's a large amount of carbonaceous material that would have any uraninite associated with it. All right, this shows the study area. Down here, these are the irrigated acres. We do have some Cretaceous rocks in green, but this is the Lance formation. It's not the deep, dark, carbonaceous rich with pyrite and a little bit of uraninite. That you find up in the Casper area. This is the Ken boundary of the Kendrick 
irrigation project off of Alcova Reservoir. We have also Cretaceous here. I would expect that they, since they have a selenium problem, I don't have any data. Uh, I actually did not look at this until two weeks ago. Years ago, I, we did the map and showed the surface water influence and forgot about it. You know, it is only getting ready for this talk. I decided, well, what are we, where are the Cretaceous rocks in Wyoming? And this is, this is where they are. And this is where we may be sourcing uranium down in this particular area. We concentrated with evaporation off of, uh, off of the reservoirs. When it gets into our valley, we have use and reuse. We have a very irrigation, very efficient conjunctive use situation where we evaporate uh, and transpire a lot of water off. We concentrate it, and that's the correlation there. Okay, summary, high plains aquifer, southern high plains aquifer, it's not due to nitrates, there's no human connection, it's a natural system, the uranium in the water has been, I mean, we've been pumping through high uranium values, hexavalent, since, you know, before irrigation started anywhere in the world, 190,000 years ago or greater, probably on the order of millions of years. Arkansas River Valley, the high uranium is due to leaching and ET and irrigation. Nitrate is a possibility, but not necessary. It, the source is pro probably Cretaceous Black Shale. That is also true in the South Platte River Valley. Now, I think Doug and I sampled one uh, area one time when we were doing a, a test hole with Jim Geeky, and uh, later on we came back, sampled the water, and we were shocked because the TDS of the shallow water was, was higher than the TDS of the deeper water. And it was, it was very high in sulfate. North Platte Valley, our uranium is imported, if you will. It is concentrated through evapotranspiration and, and the, the uranium, or the nitrate mechanism is not, I don't feel is applicable to this area. The primary source is most likely uranium in, in the found in the Cretaceous Black Shale in Wyoming. A secondary source, I think it's important locally, it's important in, uh, uh, in the Lodgepole Creek area that Mark Burback has looked at, and it's also a little bit in Pumpkin Creek. So we have a couple sources going on. Conclusions, both Nitrate and uranium are water quality issues in North Platte Valley. Uranium is transported from areas in, the, in Wyoming in surface water, distributed across the valley by irrigation canals, and it's concentrated by the consumptive use of the water. This creates the appearance of a correlation to nitrate, which is applied locally. Uranium nitrate uh, connection may deserve additional study in areas where the leaching of, of tetravalent uranium may occur. I think it's very important that you know, know your local hydrogeology. Thank you. References and acknowledgements. Uh, Robert Zelensky, USGS. David Roos, USGS. Kurt Miller, USGS. North Plan IRD for doing some of our cooperative works. D. Ebica for doing drafting. And I should put her name in there too. But Bob Zelensky, 25 years ago, recommended I look at Cretaceous sales as a source. And I did two weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks so much. And if you have questions too for Steve, um, you're welcome to put those into the chat box. I think a few have come in. Um, we'll take those together uh, after Dr. Uh, Troy Gilmore's talk. and. I think without further ado, we can just pass the baton uh, over to Troy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess you can hear me all right. And you should see my title slide here. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak and uh, appreciate all of you for taking the time to log on. I see. I 
I see many decades of Nebraska water experience represented here. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, welcome some discussion about some of the results we have from revisiting groundwater nitrate and recharge in the Dutch Flats area of North Platte NRD. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about two pieces of, uh, two parts of the study. One is repeat sampling, where we followed up on a previous study uh, done in the 1990s. And then also our kind of some exploration into machine learning approaches. Um, but First, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Marty Wells, who is the student that did the vast majority of this work. He's now employed uh, with NRCS out in Washington State. And then uh, Dr. Natalie Nelson at North Carolina State. She is an expert in machine learning. Uh, J.K. Bolke with the USGS, and I'd like to note the disclaimer at the bottom here. Uh, we have paper in review, but not published yet. <clears throat> Um, and then a few familiar names, including Steve uh, from uh, UNL. We had funding from a 104B grant from USGS and also some funding to help support Marty in this work from Water for Food. And of course, we had North Platte NRD as an excellent partner throughout these uh, efforts. So Steve already gave a great um, starting point as far as uh, water resources in western Nebraska. That's where we're going to zoom in. Most everyone on this call has seen a map, this map or one like it, uh, just highlighting high nitrate concentrations in groundwater um, in many parts of Nebraska. We're going to zoom into that western part uh, into a small area within North Platte NRD, uh, which is referred to as Dutch Flats. Um, there are three major canals, and Steve ref referenced these with the interstate canal there to the north. Um, uh, those are in light blue. Uh, you can see the North Platte River in darker blue here. And then um, highlighted here are a few red circles that show just a handful of the many well nests that are out in this area. Uh, there are several transects uh, like this. Um, if we go into a cross-sectional view that's kind of cutting along this black line that you see here, um, <clears throat> you can see a cross-section here uh, where you see those same red wells highlighted here. The vertical lines just show where there are wells installed. Uh, the squares here show where uh, individual screens are in these well nests. So most of these nests are going to have a shallow, intermediate, and deep well, but you can see that the, you know, the, the depths of those shallow, intermediate, and deep are quite, uh, there's quite a variety of depths below the water table, and there's quite a variation in beta zone thickness as well out here. Um, Steve already mentioned the precipitation out in this area, but it's also shown here. Um, but the USGS did a very intensive study out here, uh, sampling many wells and looking at groundwater nitrate and recharge rates. And this is just a quick summary of some of the highlights from that work. Um, some of you are probably maybe familiar or involved with this uh, work. But um, in their study, they found in this alluvial aquifer, um, less than nine years was the average mean or the mean groundwater age. And so compared to other unconfined uh, shallow aquifers, this is a pretty short uh, groundwater age uh, for the aquifer. And when I say groundwater age, I'm talking about the, the travel time from the water table to the point at which the groundwater was sampled, in this case, the screens in the well nest. Uh, mean recharge rate, you can see, was much higher than local precipitation. Uh, that recharge rate is calculated from the groundwater age. And then the canals, as Steve mentioned, were a substantial source of recharge. And then there was a nitrate in groundwater that was a result of leaching beneath crop fields. And then the aquifer uh, was oxic, a lot of um, Oxygen in the water, which is going to, is an indicator that we're going to have minimal denitrification, uh, which was shown in that study as well. So that's kind of the backdrop. 
Uh, when I got to Nebraska, I was looking at this study and following up on it and looking at some aerial imagery, and this is some of what I saw, uh, was a pretty substantial shift in irrigation uh, technology out in this area where just looking at least visually for these signature circular patterns from center pivots um, in 1999, around the time of the conclusion of that uh, USGS study. And uh, in this case, I'm showing 2017, but Marty uh, spent a lot of time looking at these kind of maps across the whole Dutch Flats area and then created this plot that you can see here showing a major shift in irrigation technology in this area. And so this begged the question of whether these changes in irrigation practices might have an impact on recharge rates and or significant changes in nitrate leaching if the systems are operated uh, more efficiently. Um, so we went into a, a study where we said, well, let's try to repeat some of the sampling that they did previously and see if we can uh, make some comparisons. And the question was whether or not we can observe effects on recharge rates and nitrate um, due to change in irrigation practice. And part of that question too is whether we could use isotopes and more specifically groundwater age dating to actually accomplish that. Um, so we went out to a, a small subset of those wells. This was that small 104B grant. Um, and we did some of the same age dating that was done by USGS using tritium and helium. We looked at groundwater quality and then uh, we also had a lot of nitrate data beside the, we had some from our own sampling, obviously, but also from the previous USGS study, and then a lot of North Platte NRD sampling that was done in 2016. And so I have a one slide kind of summary of that repeat sampling uh, study and results. And what I'm showing here are results for groundwater age uh, for eight wells. And so we compared the 1990s um, groundwater age that was derived from those wells um, of about 16 years. Um, which the same wells that we sampled in 2016 yielded about 19 years. And um, from those groundwater age dates, we can calculate recharge rates. And those uh, recharge rates came out as uh, 0.5 meters per year versus 0.35 meters per year. And so um, it's kind of interesting from the standpoint of uh, potentially seeing an aquifer that could be slowing down a little bit. If you have lower recharge rates, then by extension, the groundwater is moving more slowly through the aquifer. Um, at the same time, we're careful in when we talk about this, including in the study that's referenced uh, or the paper that's referenced here at the bottom, because 16 versus 19 years in the world of groundwater age dating is not a big difference. Um, and we don't have statistically significant uh, different results there. Similarly with nitrate, we saw a lower nitrate concentration in 60% of the wells in 2016 compared to the same wells sampled in that 1990 study. Uh, but again, not a statistically significant difference. Um, and the redox status, uh, or in other words, the potential for denitrification is uh, not too surprisingly hasn't changed. Um, so that's kind of a quick uh, look at that first, first study um, with kind of limited well sampling and um, with an awareness that, you know, irrigation is one, one part of the overall picture. You could have a lot of different environmental factors that could be influencing recharge rates over time. Um, and so on. And so what we wanted to do is a bit more uh, comprehensive analysis that brought in to uh, play many more environmental variables. And one way to do that is to uh, use a statistical machine learning approach and to put it kind of in a colloquial way, can we extract more information from a relatively large but messy nitrate data set? Messy in the terms that you have a very you have all those different well depths and um, very 3D problem, right? And a lot of variability, both in space and time. And so we had, and we also had, we have a long-term nitrate data set, but 
very few wells that have both frequent and consistent records that you can easily just do a trend analysis. Um, so that's why we thought it would be interesting to try uh, statistical machine learning. So this, the actual methodology of, of machine learning, which might, might think of as a subset of artificial intelligence, those types of things, the actual mathematics for a lot of this have been around, I think, for a long time, but this has really taken off in the water quality world in, in the recent decade or so. Um, so there are examples. A lot of times, um, this type of approach, including random forest, is one of the machine learning approaches, is used to improve maps or predictions of nitrate concentrations at various locations and aquifers. And um, that's been done both in the US and internationally. Um, for someone like myself who's really interested in groundwater age and travel times and lag times, I was looking at these studies and wondering, you know, how did, how did they incorporate lag times in this uh, type of framework? And there are a few ways that they, they've done this. And one is to include proxy variables. So for instance, well depth is, is a bit of a representation of, or a proxy maybe for the travel time, right? Of water from the land surface or from the water table to a well screen. In other cases, they use time sensitive variables like they said, uh, they used the 1990s era end use for that particular study area as a variable. And they also used 2000s uh, end use as a variable and then uh, tried to see which of those was more important as a predictor in the model uh, as a way of teasing out some lag time type of information. And then there's also um, some hybrid modeling that's being done where you, they're using mechanistic or, or lump parameter models to calculate variables, which then go into the machine learning model. In Nebraska, there are a couple of recent papers that have come out of the Water Center uh, that are really interesting and uh, worth a look if you're interested in this type of topic. And these, um, I don't wanna oversimplify these with uh, Chitteranjan and others on the line here, um, but uh, there were some predictions of uh, nitrate at domestic wells and also looking at factors that influence nitrate contamination, such as the Veda zone and climate. Um, for our study, we took a little bit different angle on this as opposed to the more typical mapping um, or predicting it for particular wells being the objective. In our case, we wanted to explore uh, the use of statistical machine learning and long-term groundwater nitrate data to estimate Veda zone and saturated zone transport rates um, or estimates of mean vertical velocities. Uh, and by extension, then you can calculate lag times from that kind of information. Uh, we have a paper, there's reference down here at the bottom, which is currently in review. Um, this is in a journal called HESS, uh, where the preprints pre -prints are available and there's public discussion of the paper. Uh, you can see some of the discussion that's gone on over at that website. Um, we chose to use random forest regression as our uh, model. And this is a uh, robust data analysis approach for the type of data that we're dealing with. And there is a black box kind of aspect to uh, some of this machine learning um, that we're uh, very aware of. Uh, but one of the things we like about this uh, approach is that we have some nice model performance metrics that we can look to uh, to help us kind of gauge how this model is working. Uh, one is variable importance plots. I'll show you some examples. These give a sense of the relative predictive power of different variables that we plug into the model. Partial dependence plots uh, are a graphical representation of the relation between nitrate, which is our response variable, and uh, the predictor variables, which are all the different environmental variables that we're looking at. And then uh, something nash sutcliffe efficiency, which is no doubt very familiar to uh, those who've done other types of modeling. <clears throat> so in our random forest uh, model, we started with an initial data set where we had 15 predictor variables. Again, our, our response variable or the thing that we're trying to predict is groundwater nitrate concentration. We had about a thousand observations. That's coming just out of that Dutch Flats area, which is a pretty amazing data set for that size of an area. 
Um, but we were much more comfortable, like Steve said, because we had a lot of background information on this specific area to help us think about how well this model was performing. But this came from 162 wells. One of the important things is that we have two types of variable that we attempted to use. Excuse me, one is a static variable, which is something that we, is a, essentially uh, stable over time. Uh, things like uh, the bottom of this, the well screen uh, and the lack of subsidence, of course, that's going to be pretty, the distance from the land surface to the bottom of the well is going to be pretty consistent. Beta zone thickness, uh, land surface to the water table, yes, that could change a little bit, but in the scheme of things, it's fairly static. The other variables, we could call them dynamic variables because they're changing over time, and that included the hard work that uh, Marty did in visually analyzing those images uh, to pull out uh, how much center pivot, um, how much area in the, in the study area was under center pivot, for instance. You can see that as the first variable there. So we ran, um, ran these models to see how well they predict nitrate concentrations, or that's our metric anyway for the performance of the model. This is a variable importance plot um, that we can generate when we run random forest modeling. At the bottom, you see the most important variable in the model on average. And at the top, uh, number 15 there is, was the least important uh, variable. And what we see is that those four dynamic variables were all poor predictors in this model. And um, perhaps some folks who are very familiar with machine learning could have looked at this and, and maybe predicted this uh, occurrence. But, uh, something like annual precipitation, for instance, which is an obvious driver for recharge, uh, is almost noise in this particular situation due to the variability year to year, probably, uh, being a primary reason that that was that case. Um, we also noticed, though, that there was a large variance in how tr total travel time. That was our best estimate of the time of travel from the land surface to the well screen that we calculated, and I'll talk about more. But uh, we saw a lot of variance there suggesting maybe there was some sensitivity in this model to that variable. So we proceeded by, uh, we actually just removed those dynamic variables, including Marty's hard work on the center pivot irrigated area. And then we decided let's hone in on this total travel time as a key variable. And so I want to tell you a little bit more about how we calculated that and how we used it. Uh, for each well, we calculated the total travel time um, just based on vertical transport uh, through the beta zone and saturated zone. So simple vertical transport equations there. Um, and so we had a total travel time predictor that we calculated for each of these wells. Um, but what we did to try to test out uh, this variable with, in more detail is that we calculated total travel time for each well using a wide range of different transport rates. So the idea was, is there a pair of beta zone and saturated zone or groundwater transport rates that would ultimately give us the optimal model, the, the best performing model? Um, and we did this in 0.25 meter per year increments, which led to just about 300 combinations of transport rates. So that's uh, 288 additional columns in the spreadsheet, so to speak, uh, that were evaluated individually then. Um, so a lot of model runs for Marty uh, in this project. When we ran all of those different uh, values, we were hoping to see, you know, a couple models maybe, uh, a couple scenarios, I should say, where, for instance, the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency really just popped out as, well, this is definitely the best model. Um, but you can see that we had a really narrow range of uh, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency for these different scenarios. And so that was not real conducive to saying, yes, that is the single best model in this, uh, out of all these different scenarios. But what we did look at was the uh, total travel time variable in that um, in that, um, excuse me, the, uh, the relative, that uh, variable importance plot that shows the relative importance of the different predictors. And we looked at the one where 
total travel time had the maximum impact, basically. It was the strongest predictor. And when we did that, um, we have a VEDO zone transport rate of 3.5 meters per year and a saturated zone uh, transport rate of 3.75 meters per year. Now that we have transport rates, this pair of transport rates, we can convert those to recharge rates, which is much more conducive to comparing to previous work. And so when we use the value that came from the beta zone transport rate, uh, random forest ultimately is suggesting uh, about 0.38 meters per year as a recharge rate. And what we find is that this is actually quite consistent with the recharge rates under crop fields. So that kind of diffuse recharge across the landscape um, coming from shallow wells that are far away from the canals uh, in previous work. Uh, when we looked at the recharge rate that we calculate from uh, the saturated zone transport rate in that, in that, that we just showed you, uh, the random forest gave 1.27 meters per year, which was actually very consistent with intermediate wells, which had been identified in previous work as having uh, been influenced strongly by the um, uh, the focus recharge uh, beneath canals. So that water is moving down and over to these intermediate wells. Um, so it's just kind of some interesting uh, comparisons there with previous work. Um, if you kind of stretch this a little bit further and, and feel like similar to Steve, I want to emphasize this is a bit more on the speculative side, but it's an interesting question. Uh, about the relative contribution of these recharge rates. So if we make some major assumptions, one is that the random forest has identified like two important governing, uh, two really important different recharge rates across that landscape. Um, and you use the previous groundwater age dating results. This would suggest that 55% of the recharge is from the diffuse resource, diffuse sources across the uh, landscape, uh, whereas 45% would be coming from focused recharge. Again, some major simplifying assumptions there. Uh, so the last two slides here, I just want to give you a sense of, of some of the uh, partial dependence plots that we can see. We have these types of plots for every variable that we put into the model, every predictor variable. And again, this is a graphical representation um, uh, of the relationship that the model is kind of seeing between the predictor variable on the vertical axis, that's nitrate, and the, uh, excuse me, the response variable on the vertical axis, nitrate, and the predictor variable along the bottom. So we show, we are showing here the influence on nitrate concentration of major canals on the right and on minor canals, which you might think of as laterals, um, on nitrate concentration. And, um, in short, what we see is that we see uh, a result that is intuitive and it's consistent with previous work that shows that those, for instance, shallow wells very close to the uh, canals have an annual dilution of nitrate due to the low nitrate water that is being recharged from the canals. And as you move further away from the canal, you're getting more and more of that uh, uh, crop field influence as far as nitrate leaching and so on. So these are examples of some things that help kind of give us some sense of reality, what the types of patterns that the model is picking up, and whether that's kind of giving us some realistic relationships. And we see this on quite a few of the other variables that where, where things are kind of making sense. Um, and so lastly, uh, we can look at nitrate relative to the total travel time from the land surface to the well. So this is that key variable we were talking about earlier, and we see a substantial drop off in nitrate concentrations for travel times greater than seven years. And collectively, the statistical machine learning results are consistent with previous observations of relatively um, high, uh, excuse me, short transit times uh, for water and nitrate in this aquifer. And you see that very sharp threshold around seven years. Um, possibly reflecting some combination of recent management practices um, and or a tendency for nitrate concentrations to be higher in diffuse uh, infiltration recharge than in canal leakage water. And so um, just in conclusion, we, we did um, 
uses random forest to identify some what we consider optimal vados and saturated zone transport rates and they were consistent with previous work um, this there might be some value here in uh, using this type of modeling as kind of diagnostic or using it as a to leverage basically long-term nitrate data sets uh, maybe in advance of doing more um, detailed numerical modeling for instance but we highlight that this is a one-time uh, study here. It could have some site-specific things going on. We do have two very distinct recharge sources that we already knew about. Um, and we note also that given that the groundwater here is oxic, not a lot of denitrification, we're kind of treating nitrate a little bit, like a, kind of like a conservative tracer um, in this type of work. And so, there are two factors there. One is if you have an aquifer where you have denitrification, you, need to, you would need to account for that. And then the other thing is that um, there might be some biases toward uh, the higher nitrate groundwater and or you might be missing some of the signals um, by relying totally on groundwater samples, you might be missing some of the signals of nitrate that's still stored in the beta zone uh, above the water table. And so with that, I thank you very much for your, your attention, for your attendance today, and for the opportunity uh, to speak with you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Troy, and thank you, Steve. Uh, I thought two really complimentary and really focused talks. Um, it's about 3.03 here in uh, CDT time, and so what we're going to do is take uh, maybe five or so minutes for some Q&A. There was a couple questions that came in on the chat that I will have um, Kelsey Jamison, our student intern, just read out to the group. Hopefully you all can hear her. And then we'll get started with the next session, the um, social science and water for agriculture session at 3.15. So hopefully a couple minutes in between questions and the start of the next session. But Kelsey, I hope you're able to see the, the questions that came in on the chat box. Yes. <clears throat> I have one question from Anne. Her first question was, does the leaking cause nitrates to pollute the groundwater? And that was during Steve Sabre's talk. Well, I, I think Troy alluded to it, uh, the uh, canal water typically is low in nitrate. And so actually we get a seasonal change. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, nitrate levels, when actually total TDS, total dissolved solids, changes uh, seasonally. Uh, during the spring when the canal water is put in, we have low, ni low nitrate waters coming in and diluting things. And as the season goes along, we uh, concentrate things through evapotranspiration and le leaching of nitrates out of the soil zone. So there's a seasonal variation. But the leaking canals, we didn't have leaking canals. Our nitrate levels may be a lot higher, but then again, we wouldn't have the aquifer as extensive as it is and all that. So it's a, a good, very good question. It's a very complicated answer. And I should turn it over to Troy on that. I agree, Steve. <laughs> I think it was well answered. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? I can... There, yes, uh, Steve and Troy, I think probably both of you could address this one. This is from Nathan Rossman. Uh, in the Hastings area, uh, where Nolan and all did most of their field testing, do you know if the NO3 mechanism may hold more water in that particular area. When you're talking about the nitrate mechanism, if you're, if Nathan's talking about the uranium, to be honest with you, I don't know that area. All hydrogeology tends to be local. However, I do know on the Central Platte NRD that uh, Roy and Mary Spaulding did a lot of work for the, and I would look at that literature for an answer on that particular question in regards to nitrate uranium mechanism. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that question came in during Steve's talk. Okay. I assume that's what it was yeah, if it's referring in, to. In the yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I, I can only point to areas that I've read about, the USGS has done studies, or I have experienced uh, personally. And so it's, it's kind of uh, on the top of the uranium, the nitrate mechanism. I would love to give a talk. <laughs> I could go on uh, a long time on, on that. I can, Doug Hallam and I have, have done some work and I'm giving a presentation in September uh, on uh, paleosols, recognizing uranium source rocks in, in uh, sedimentary sequences. And uh, if anybody wants a more detailed discussion of that, uh, you know, get, contact us. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we've still got a couple of minutes. If people have a question they'd like to enter in the chat box, have at it. Um, now's the time. I was going to say, I, I oh, go ahead. Oh, Kelsey, did you get <laughs> did you get that one? Yes. Um, Steve, what are the chances that the canal will be sealed in order to stop the leaking? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it would be, it would cost a heck of a lot of money. Uh, ag is not, it's, in, it's, it's not going to increase the efficiency of the system. I mean, if a lot of engineers look at the situation at first glance, they're going to say this is inefficient, but if they have, look at the overall conjunctive use of the situation, the water is used and reused many times. And uh, so I don't think the chances are very good. And uh, I, I think that's a positive. I did see another question on chat that concerning the Southern High Plains Aquifer has lowering the water table increased the concentration of uranium. That's another very good question that's very difficult to answer. Uh, one thing that's happening is lowering the water table is decreasing the amount of reach, uh, discharge on the, it's bringing up the uranium rich water. So it's decreasing that source. And I think you'd have to model it. It's a very complicated question. Part of it answer is, is the fact that that water is fairly old. What's responsible for the uranium mineralization has happened you know, tens of thousands of years before now. So that water was naturally high in uranium before. But lowering the Vados zone, lowering the water table, if the source of uranium is in that area, it has a tendency to, uh, a big Vados zone has a tendency to, you're, you're introducing more oxygen, if you will, or if you have a source bed for uranium that become, you lower the water table below that, it goes, you get higher oxygen, in that particular zone, you can increase leaching, but you're talking, you're talking long periods of time. You're not talking Troy's type of time time period. You're talking tens of years, hundreds of years, or thousands of years easily, if not millions of years. So, but Beta zone leaching is what happens. What what mobilizes uranium, and I got some neat slides showing how the oxygen has influenced uranium mineralization over time. If we had, I call those my bonus slides that I included, but I, I don't think we have time for it. Thanks, Steve, and, and thanks, Karen and Doug, for the question. It's 310, so I think to allow for some time to cross over in between the hydrogeology session and the next session, we may just um, take a moment to pause and people who are in the waiting room can um, be admitted. And I'd invite everyone who was on the first call to please uh, stay tuned for this next one. That was, uh, you know, the hydrogeological subterranean view. And we'll get one um, in this next session that's more um, from the ground up and sociological. So we'll be back in about five minutes with that. and. Uh, Stay tuned. Thank you again so much to Steve and to Troy for those great talks to lead us off. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.